Amen. God bless you. Good to see everybody here in the house of the Lord this morning. I don't know, there's something about spring and Palm Sunday and all of these things as we start getting closer to Easter. That's just, it's a special time of year. It just kind of gives you all the, gives you the warm and fuzzies. Uh, so we're glad to see a lot of smiling faces out there today. And those of you that aren't smiling, maybe you'll crack a smile sometime between now and, and the end. Uh, but we want to jump into the word this morning. First of all, I got to ask, Bob, are you really 76? Okay. <laughs> Let's go I was going to say, man, I got to know your secret. I, I wouldn't have thought you'd be that also. Okay. Well, we're going to start this morning. Uh, if you want to open your Bibles in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm actually going to read just one verse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7. I'll kind of give a little bit of um, synopsis of what this is coming from. But I just kind of want to start with this one verse this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 just simply says, For the mystery of iniquity doth always work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And I want to preach this morning on that one phrase there, mystery of iniquity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather here in your name, in your place, with your people. God, as we have felt your presence so strong and so real during the worship today, that you literally, Lord, have been here in, your, in our presence, God, to, to touch already and begin to convict hearts and strengthen hearts and comfort hearts. Lord, your word accomplishes all of those things within us, whatever that we need. And so I come before you humbly this morning asking for your anointing of the Holy Spirit, that you would speak the word as you see fit, God, and that we all might take it and, and, and receive it, Lord, and not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word as well. We have a, a problem with sin. We recognize that as human beings, Lord, but you're the answer. And we turn to you now, the author and the finisher of our faith, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 So I'm going to kind of, uh, let me kind of pick this verse apart here just a little bit, give you a little bit of background. He's talking about, we're talking about the mystery of iniquity. So first of all, iniquity is just sin, okay? Ultimately, if you do what God says not to do, that's sin, if you don't do what God says you're supposed to do, that's sin. Sin and iniquity, pretty much the same thing. And Paul's talking about the mystery of iniquity or the mystery of sin. So I'm not going to go into the details of this whole chapter. There's a lot in there. But just the basics of what's going on here, what Paul is writing about, is he's, he's reassuring the church in Thessalonica that the day of the Lord had not happened yet. There was some confusion there. Some people come along and said, oh, well, the Lord's already come. And he's, he's reassuring them, no, the Lord has not come uh, yet. He said that before the Lord comes, before that day happens, uh, there's, there's going to be some things that take place. There's going to be a great falling away. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Uh, he said there's going to be a, a rising of Antichrist uh, who will basically lead a worldwide rebellion against God like has never been seen before. And so he's saying all of that, it won't officially happen until God says it's time to happen, right? In God's time, all that will take place. But even though that place, that, that time hasn't taken place yet, the mystery of iniquity is already at work. So in other words, like John, in, in the epistles of John, he writes about how, uh, he writes about a coming antichrist, you know, that one day will, you know, um, deceive the world and so on and so forth. And the antichrist hasn't come to the world, but what John is saying is that the spirit of antichrist is already in the world right, has been from the beginning because, because that's Satan basically uh, doing everything against that, that we, which is God. And so he's saying the spirit of Antichrist is very much alive and real and leading people away from Jesus, right? Uh, the mystery of iniquity already at work. And sin, it, what is a mystery? A mystery is something that's just unexplainable, right? You take John, he's writing in these, uh, his epistles about the coming of the Antichrist and it, it, he, basically the spirit already being here. If you look, and I think I might have mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but in, in John's writing in the gospel of John, John chapter 6, verse 66, he says this, and this, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with Jesus. It's a, is it a coincidence that uh, uh, John chapter 666 six, six was people turning away from Jesus? It's the spirit of Antichrist, right? Even in Jesus' day, people were walking away from him. And it didn't make sense. Here's the thing. Here, these disciples, these were disciples that walked away from Jesus and no longer walked with him. This wasn't people who were just kind of on the fence and maybe, you know, unbelievers. These are people who saw Jesus do great and mighty things. These are people who heard his words from heaven and still yet, despite knowing what is right, they turned away and they never walked with Jesus anymore. They had given in, to, they had been deceived ultimately by the spirit of Antichrist, which was Satan, the father of all lives. So a mystery is something that you can't explain. The mystery of sin. In other words, why in the world would we ever do something that God doesn't want us to do? It really doesn't make any sense, does it? I want to show you that from the scripture. We've all done it. 
We all do it regularly, but it really doesn't make sense. This is what Paul's saying here. Iniquity or sin is really kind of a mystery if you stop and think about it. Why in the world would Adam and Eve give up paradise? You can read through the first three chapters of Genesis, and it gives us a picture of what Eden was like. After God created the world and he created Adam and Eve, he planted a garden called Eden, and that's where they lived. And it was absolute paradise. And so this is just a couple little snippets from Genesis chapter 2 that kind of gives us an idea of what the Garden of Eden was really like. It says, The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man who he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Adam and, could, Adam and Eve could eat anything they wanted and not gain weight. That's paradise. Right? It says, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. Just imagine how beautiful that must have been. The gold of the land was good. Lots of gold and treasures, this beautiful place. A mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. And so when you go on and you read basically these things and then you find out like after Adam and Eve sinned and the, the curses that came and, and what changed, we get this really good picture of what Eden was like. There was no sin in the Garden of Eden, right? And so no sin meant that there was no shame, there was no guilt, there was no condemnation. Can you imagine a peace like that? They, they'd never sinned against God, so they never knew what shame and guilt was, what was like because they'd never done anything wrong. There was no pain whatsoever. Childbirth, ladies, was a breeze. Literally. The curse, you know, the child pain in childbirth was one of the curses of sin. So before sin, childbirth would have been a breeze. It would have just been like a woman's pregnant and all of a sudden, oh, look, the baby's here. Right? I mean, it'd be just that easy. No pain whatsoever associated with childbirth. There were no black thumbnails. One of the curses of, of man was that we would have to work by the sweat of our brow. Adam had responsibilities. There were things he was doing, but he didn't have like real labor intensive work where he really had to work things. That was part of the curse. So before sin, you know, Adam would be working on something. He'd hit his thumb with the hammer and he'd just go, oh, look at that. And he'd keep on going. It wouldn't hurt. There was no pain in the Garden of Eden. There were no sunburns. They were naked. In the sun, everywhere they went, but they never got a sunburn because there were no pain. There was no pain. There were no thorns, no ticks and chiggers. Well, they might have been there, but they didn't bite you. No, no snake bites, right? One of the things that whenever after sin came in, God cursed the snake that Satan used and cursed man. He said, now, from now on, there's going to be uh, ma mankind and snakes are going to be enemies, and there's obviously a bigger picture in that in, in the seed of the serpent being ultimately uh, Satan and sin and the seed of um, Eve being um, uh, Jesus. Ultimately, it's talking about a war that will happen between Satan and Jesus. But in the, in the literal sense, from that moment forward, snakes and mankind became enemies. I don't know about you, when I see a poisonous snake, he's my enemy, right? And he must die. A horrible and gruesome death, if necessary. That began then. So before sin, Adam could have been walking through the Garden of Eden and there'd be like a cobra. He could have picked up a king cobra and stuck it over his neck and, you know, been petting it. No big deal because, you know, there's no sin. No snake bites, no animal attacks, no storms, no earthquakes, no volcanic eruptions, no tsunamis. There wasn't even any rain. It didn't even rain back then. The way that God made everything grow was that he made a mist come up from the ground. He watered it from below. Never any rain. So when Adam and Eve would plan a trip like Silver Dollar City, they never had to worry about it raining them out. There was no rain, no storm clouds. Every day was a beautiful, sunny, perfect temperature day. No humidity, no 95 degrees in the shade, no sub-zero temperatures. It was a perfect temperature all the time. Beautiful days. There were no arguments. Do you know why there were no arguments in the Garden of Eden? Because there were no toilet seats to argue as to whether it should be up or whether it should be down, right? Adam and Eve had a perfect marriage. They never one time spat or had any kind of disagreement. It was pure bliss in their marriage. There was no fighting. There was no murder. There was no theft. There was no extortion, no drugs, no lying. There was no sickness. They had divine health. Adam and Eve never one time threw up. They didn't know what it meant to throw up. They never run a fever. They never so much as had the sniffles. They didn't even have allergies. We've all been talking about allergies right now. It's spring and we're all snorting and sniffling and snotting, you know, and stuff. They didn't have any of that. Perfect health, no sickness. And the main thing was there was no death. No death at all. God said, in the day that you eat the fruit, in other words, when you sin, 
you shall surely die. It is sin that brought death on the human race. They, Adam and Eve, we don't know how long they lived in the garden before all of that happened, but here's the thing. Get something to think about this now. If Adam and Eve would not have eaten the forbidden fruit, if they had not sinned, they would still be alive today. Right? If they, had, if they would have never committed any sin, they would still, I mean, Matt was talking about in his uh, apologetic series, you know, give, talking about, you know, the earth being somewhere around 6,000 years old or whatever. Adam and Eve would be 6,000 years old, still alive today, and they wouldn't be like old and decrepit. They would be like the same age they were when God created them. They'd be in better shape than any of us. Because death came after sin came. It was perfect. It was paradise. So it just leaves it. We talk about the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of sin. Why in the world would they give that up? Isn't that a mystery? Why would they give that up? Adam and Eve did not realize the magnitude of the effects of the sin. I mean, they knew. I mean, God said, you know, in the day you eat, you'll surely die. And so they've listened to the father of lies. They listened to the deception of Satan who says, you won't surely die. And so they're being deceived and they just didn't recognize how impactful this sin was going to be on the remainder of their life. Right? That's part of, that's part of Satan's deception, right? He leaves that part out. He said to Adam and Eve, oh, you'll, you'll be like God and you'll have all of this wisdom and you'll know things, which was true to a certain extent, but he left out the part how they were going to have horrible pain in childbirth and, and have sickness and eventually die. He, Satan left that part out. And that's the way sin works. Sin is so appealing, it's so good, and we forget. It causes us to forget what we know to be right. It's a mystery. Why would, why would they have ever given in? Same reason that we do. There's a preacher who's gone on, gone on to be with the Lord uh, recently, but um, his name is uh, Rabbi Zacharias. And he, this is a quote from him I thought was really good. He said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Sin always takes from us more than we ever thought it would. That's what happened with Adam and Eve. Why? You think, why in the world would they give that up? It's because they were deceived. It's a mystery. Why would you do anything that God doesn't want you to do? How many times do you think throughout their lives, because they didn't just drop dead in that moment. It was from that moment they began to die. They started aging. They started having pain. The thorns began to grow. God, God drove them out of the Garden of Eden. They no longer had access to that. Now you got to go out here where the thorn bushes are and the, the snakes are going to start biting you and all that kind of stuff. All of that was gone. How many times do you think throughout, that, uh, throughout their life did Adam and Eve go, why did we do that? It was a mystery even to them. Why did we do that? We had it made. Every time he, now he hits his thumb and it turns black and he's throwing the hammer and he's saying words he'd never heard before, you know, and he's like, it didn't hurt before. Why did we do that? Eve was giving birth to their sons in this horrible, terrible pain. And she's like, why did we? So many times it was a mystery to them. Why in the world didn't we just do what God wanted us to do in the first place? It would have been so much better. It really wouldn't have been that hard to just obey God. You know they beat themselves up forever. It's a mystery. Have you ever? Ever been in those shoes? I have time and time again. Why did I do that? Why did I say that? Have a conversation with somebody, lose my temper, say something I should, what? And then feel bad about it later. Why did I say that? Why did I do this? It's a mystery. Why would I ever do something that God doesn't want me to do? The, re the reward for Adam and Eve, the, re the reward is always eternal life. It was, you know, that was their re reward. But the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. I read something, here we're back. I can't remember where I read this, but it, I, I didn't forget it. I thought this was really good. Uh, it said, sin will fascinate you and then it will assassinate you. Wow. Sin will fascinate you and then it will assassinate you. Because one thing that the scripture teaches us very clearly is that there is pleasure in sin. Amen. Sin can be fun to the flesh, but it specifies the pleasure in sin is only for a season. It only lasts, lasts so long. And so that which fascinates us, that which draws our flesh, that which is wrong, that which is sinful, that, the, that God specifically said don't do, um, which we find in his word. That's why the word of God is so important for us to know what we're not supposed to do and what we're supposed to do. And so when we, uh, we, we see that or we do that, that we know we're not supposed to, there's this pleasure, there's this desire, this longing. It fascinates us. And then when we give in, in the end, it ends up bringing us death. It, is, it assassinates us, not only in the natural sense. We're all going to die because of sin. Every single person in this room has sinned, therefore every person in this room will die, right? That's, that's the way that it works. Um, but even when we give in 
to, to sin and to temptation that it, it can assassinate our character. It can assassinate our name. It can assassinate our joy and our peace, right? And it destroys that which God, what Jesus died ultimately to give us. Samson, bless his heart, is one guy we read about in the scripture that learned this the hard way about sin fascinating you and then ultimately in the end assassinating you. Samson was just a, just a short, I mean, a lot of you may know about Samson, but just real shortly, Samson was a man who lived a long, long time ago. And God gave him, we read about him in, in the book of Judges. And God just gave him this supernatural physical strength. Okay, he had long hair. He'd taken the vow of a Nazarite, which meant he couldn't cut his hair. He couldn't eat anything that was grown on a vine, like he couldn't eat grapes or, any, or drink wine or anything like that. And he couldn't be around any dead bodies. Um, but he was very strong. And he, I mean, there was one instance where Samson fought 1,000 Philistine soldiers with just the jawbone of a donkey and won. Okay? That gives you an indication of the strength that this man had. He, a lion came out against him one day. He grabs it by the jaws and rips it in half. He, said, he just had supernatural strength, according to the scripture. But Samson had a he got, Samson would get so wrapped up in the pleasures of sin, things that he knew he wasn't supposed to have, but he was fascinated by them. One day, he, was, he came by that very same lion that he had killed. He comes back by that way one day, and there's, the bees had made a, a big hive of honey inside the carcass of this lion. And he's like, man, that honey looks good. That honey, was, it fascinated him. That honey, he knows that honey is sweet. He wanted that honey. But as a, Naz, you know, as a Nazarite, he wasn't supposed to be around any dead bodies. So he ignored that. And he went and got the honey anyway, right? It was a compromise in which he gave in. He did what he knew he wasn't supposed to do. He began, man, he started, he married uh, somebody that was not an a Israelite woman. That was forbidden. God said, I don't want you to marry people from other countries because they all have false gods, right? They all worship these idols. And he said, I want you to marry people who, that worship me, right? Samson ignored that. He started, you know, he wanted to marry a lady from the Philistines. She fascinated him. Their lifestyle fascinated him. That sin fascinated him. So he ignored what God said not to do. And then, little by little, he had nights full of prostitutes, you name it, he did it. Such a fascination with sin. But in the end, it ended up assassinating him. In the end, Samson, as much as heart, you thought he saw it coming. Um, you know it's easier to see sin in somebody else than it is in yourself. You can watch somebody going down the wrong road and you're like, why would they do that? They're going down the wrong road. But we don't see it in ourselves. That's what was happening in Samson. Samson met a woman by the name of Delilah. He felt like he was head over heels in love with this woman. Wanted her to be his wife and, and uh, so on and so forth. Well, she concocted this plan with the Philistines. Samson, see, turns out when, when Samson would uh, kill a lot of the Philistine soldiers, turns out that made the Philistines not like him very much, right? And so the Phil Philistines wanted Samson captured. They wanted him dead. And so they, can, they got this whole plan together with Delilah and said, if you can figure out why he's so strong, get to the bottom of this. Find out the source of his strength so that we can take his strength away and we can catch him. And so she strikes up a date. She shakes her hair and she get, you know, gets it. And she's like, got the perfume on and the bag. And she, they have a date. And she's like, Samson, what is it that makes you so strong? We didn't really want to tell her, right? So he makes up this story. Well, if you, if you were to tie me up with new ropes, I would be weak. It'd take away my strength. So she ties him up with new ropes and says, Sam, while he's asleep, and says, Samson, the Philistines are here. And he jumps up. He just snaps the ropes off. No problem. And she realizes he lied to me. So she goes to him and she's like, Samson, I thought you loved me. What's the source of your strength? He says, well, I'll tell you what. If you take green twigs, they haven't died yet. They're fresh. They're green. And you tie me up with those, it'll take away my strength. So when he falls asleep, she ties him up with green twigs. And says, the Philistines are here. He jumps up, he pops them off like no big deal, and, and he realizes that there's no Philistines, like she said. She realizes he lied to me. So she says, again, you're not telling me the truth. What is the source of your strength? He says, well, if you, if you weave the locks of my hair. Remember, he's never had a haircut, so his hair is way down. If you weave the locks of my hair, then I'll be weak. So when he falls asleep, she weaves the locks of his hair, and says, the Samson, the Philistines are here. He jumps up. Philistines weren't there. But she realized that he had lied again. He still had his strength. Finally, she gets serious to him. And she basically says, you don't love me if you don't tell me the truth. You tell me what your strength is or I'm out of here. And so he tells her, my strength is in my hair. My hair has never been cut. If my hair was to be cut, then I would lose all my strength. 
Isn't that a mystery? Isn't that odd? Isn't sin so weird that he would literally give away the source of his strength? The sin that fascinated him and drew him in was about to destroy him. So he falls asleep. She cuts his hair off. The Philistines come in. They capture him. They tie him up. He has no strength to get loose. They poke his eyeballs out. They take him into the mill and they're making him push. And they're just making, and they literally would make him work as a slave with no eyes. And everybody would stand around and laugh at him and mock him. Right? And in the end, Bob says that he calls out to God for mercy. Aren't you glad we can always call out to God for mercy? But the consequences were still there. Right? He asked for God's mercy and God gave him mercy. God gave him forgiveness. But God didn't just magically pick him up and undo all of the stuff he had just done. He pushes the beams to the pillars of this place and the whole place comes down. And all of Sam Samson, all the people who were mocking him, they were all dead in that moment. But Samson also lost his life. That which fascinated him that he could not get free from ended up assassinating him in the end. Why would anybody do that? Why would you compromise your strength so, I got an illustration here for you this morning. If we know the law of reaping and sowing, okay, we know it according to the scripture says that which you reap, you, or that which you sow, you shall also reap. Which just means whatever kind of seed you plant, that's the kind of fruit you're going to get. We understand that from a literal sense and from a spiritual sense, obviously. But what I have here is a potato. I love potatoes. Amen. You eat them so many ways. Smash them, mash them, bake them, fry them, grill them, whatever. I will eat them. They're fantastic. I love potatoes. What we have here is a disgusting, nasty onion. Satan's fruit, if you will. <laughs> I'm pretty sure onions are demonic. Unless you deep fry them, if you deep fry them or batter them, it kind of it cooks the spirits out of them. I guess they're a little, they're a little more tolerable. Although, I mean, even when you fry them, I mean, they're just They'll still possess you for a while, right? Onions are nasty. I asked Sweetie, please, uh, I said, I need a, an onion. I asked her to double bag it so that I wouldn't get any onion juice on me at all. Have you ever watched The Wizard of Oz when they throw the water on her and she's like, I'm melting, I'm melting. That's what happens if I get onion juice on me. I can't stand it. In fact, I can smell it through these two bags. It's horrible. Why would anybody eat this? I don't understand. I just don't understand. I love these. I hate these. So how much sense would it make if I wanted to grow these? How much sense would it make for me to plant these? I want something that I like, so I'm going to plant something I hate? That makes no sense whatsoever. Why would anybody do that? We wouldn't in a natural sense. If I want God's blessing, then why would I disobey him and reap the consequences? Right? I want the goodness of God. But if I so to the flesh. In other words, I just do what my body wants and I ignore what God wants, then I end up getting onions, right? I end up getting the curse. I end up getting the negative things that the sin will always bring. Remember, it costs you more than you were willing to pay, take you further than you were willing to go. That's just the way that sin works, unfortunately. There is always, always, always forgiveness for sin. Thank God for that. But there's always, always, always consequences for the sins that we commit as well. Amen. We pay the price for those. The long-term long consequences of our sin is not worth the short-term pleasure that it gives us. Amen. Think about that. Think about that when you're faced with a decision and you're being tempted to do something that you know is not right. Um, think about the long-term. Is the long-term effects of what I'm about to do worth this short-term pleasure? Right? And I guarantee you, you'll come to the conclusion that it's not worth it. Um, Sweetie and I, we, we like to watch, uh, every now and again we'll watch Dateline. You ever watch Dateline? And you, you watch this, it's true. I mean, they literally something that happened in the United States of America. And you watch, maybe you know, like sometimes there'll be like somebody who plans out this entire murder. You know what I mean? They just, they, for whatever reason they want somebody dead. And they plan this whole thing out and actually kill somebody. And we're, we're always, every time we watch something like that, we're always like, why would anybody do that? If you, I mean, you know that if you kill somebody, you are most likely going to get caught because most of the time they do. If you're going to kill somebody, you know you're going to get caught and you know that when you get caught, you're going to stand in front of a judge and you know that judge is going to sentence you to life in prison. And it's a whole lifetime of prison for one little moment of vindication or revenge or whatever, you know, it was that brought them to that point. It doesn't make any sense for somebody to do that. 
But in the same sense, and that may seem extreme, but in the same sense, we do that all the time. We do that every time we sin, right? Why would we do that? It's such a mystery. If I know that the effects of my sin are going to be long term, and ultimately, if I know that one day I will stand in front of the judge of all judges, right, and give an account for the sins, if I know I'm going to stand in front of Jesus and give an account for everything that I did, then why in the world would I do what he doesn't want me to do? Yet I do on so many occasions. It's, it's a mystery. It doesn't make any sense. Why would... In a, lot of in a lot of cases, you know, especially whether it's the murder or, or any sin, whatever it is, the, I, the thing that gets to us basically that, that kind of brings us to that point in a lot of ways is this hope that maybe somehow we'll get away with it. I'm going to plan out this murder and maybe I'll get away with it. And they, they very seldom ever do. This is a principle, there's another principle in the scripture that says something like this. And this is God's principle so it will never fail. And it says, be sure your sins will find you out. Even if you commit a crime or a sin on this planet and no person ever finds out, God knows it. Be sure your sins will find you out. There's just a principle God has built into humanity that when we do the wrong thing, nothing good can come from it, right? We do the wrong thing and it's going to come back and bite us somewhere along the way. Everything that's hidden will be made manifest. Nothing can be hidden, Jesus said. If I know, according to the scripture, that I will never get away with a sin without God knowing it, then why would I do it? Yet I do. Why would we commit sin knowing that we're going to stand before the judge of all judges? The Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's everybody. Everybody who has trans transgressed God's law will stand before Jesus and we will declare, you were right and we were wrong. Right? And be reminded of everything we ever did that was wrong. Unless we have trusted in Jesus to take away all of our sins. Unless we have trusted our sins to the Lord Jesus Christ. David says this in Psalm chapter 4 verse 40 verse 2. David says, He, God, brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Paul, or, uh, David's talking about the pit of sin that he'd gotten himself into. David gave in to temptation. When he looked at Bathsheba, she was a married woman and he knew he wasn't supposed to have anything to do with her. He wasn't supposed to have a, a sexual relationship with her. He knew that. And he overrode, that sin fascinated him, if you will. He overrode the Holy Spirit going, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And he has an affair with a married woman. He has her husband killed, has a baby with her. And he gets himself into this deep pit of sin, miry, slippery clay that he just can't get himself out of. He said, but God in his mercy, he reached down into the pit, the miry clay, and he pulled me up out of the miry clay, set my feet on solid ground, not slippery clay, but set my feet on solid ground and established my goings. What does that tell me? It tells me that David's saying, God pulled me out of the pit, put me on some solid ground and wanted me to get away from the pit. How much, would make, how much sense would it make in a, in a natural sense? Let's say, let's say that you fell in a pit and you were down there for five days. And you, you had resorted to the fact that you were probably going to die in that pit. You were hungry, you were cold, you were thirsty, and you're regretting get, being, getting in that pit. And you think to yourself, I'm, I'm never going to get out of here. I've resorted to the fact that I'm going to die here. And then somebody comes along and they throw down a rope and they get you out. How many of you would go to the edge of that and go, well, isn't, what's, what's still down in there? I mean, would you ever get close to the edge of that thing and, and look? No, you would, you would run as far away from that pit as you could because you don't ever want to get back in there. Yet in sin, we do that so many times. God forgives us. He brings us out of that pit. We cannot conquer sin on our own. Jesus did that at the cross. And he pulls us out and he says, now get away from the sin. But we have a tendency many times to dabble around the edge again. How much sense does that make? Been there, done that. But it, it's just a mystery. It's a mystery. What if you were locked in a cage for months at a time? Suddenly, somebody comes along and frees you. You're out of the cage. You're free. You can go wherever you want to. And then you look back in that cage, and there's something that you really love. It's like a Reese's peanut butter cup in there or something. And you think, ooh, that looks pretty good. I'll do a lot for a Reese's peanut butter cup. And you go back into this prison that you just got out of for the Reese's peanut butter cup 
And somebody slams the door on you in their yard. How much sense would that? No. I mean, I, I, if you spent months in a prison cell and somebody lets you out and you see the Reese's, Pe- Reese's peanut butter cup or whatever it is that you love, you're going to think, nah. I mean, nah, you would think that the idea would be, I'm not going back in there. I'll find me something else to eat, right? It's not worth being trapped again for just a moment of pleasure because I eat that Reese's peanut butter cup and a day later, no, let's face it, 30 minutes later, I want another one, right? It's not worth it. It wouldn't make any sense. God said to the Israelites, he said, I'm going to give you, when he gave the commandments, he said, I, I, I give you the option of a blessing or a curse. I mean, literally, God's nice. He doesn't force us to serve him. It is literally our choice. God presented the commandments to the Israelites and he said, here's the deal. Don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness against your neighbor, don't lie. You know, all these things. He gives the commandments and he says, now, here's what I don't want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. But your choice, I am presenting to you a blessing or a curse. A blessing or a curse, right? Your choice, if you want my blessing, God says, then obey my commandments. But if you don't want to obey the, the commandments, that's fine. You'll get the curse. Who would pick a curse over a blessing from God? Nobody in, the, nobody in the right mind. Yet, they did. Yet, they broke God's commandments and his law and ended up with a curse. They made that decision. And folks, we can, we can look at old Samson and we can look at old Israel and think, man, them people are stupid. What a mystery that they would ignore. But yet, we do it every time we sin against God. All right? So I give you the blessing, the option of blessing, I give you a curse. And every time we choose sin, it negatively affects us. We bring on the curse. Why would somebody do that? Why would you go to a buffet table with all of your favorite foods? Got ribs and fried chicken and potato. I'm hungry this morning. Can you tell? It's a lot of food, a lot of food references in my message this morning. But you go to a buffet table and all the food that you can imagine, all your favorite stuff, it's nutrition, it's good for you and gives you sustenance. Why, and why would you walk away from the buffet table and go out and start eating grass out of the yard? That, w- that wouldn't make any sense at all. We take the blessings of God. The blessings of God are like the buffet. It satisfies our soul. When we honor God and we do what God wants us to do, it is a blessing to us and it fulfills us as human beings. It satisfies the soul. But when we reject God and we do that, when we settle, ultimately, when we settle for sin, um, it ends up leaving us feeling empty. Like eating grass rather than the buffet. The sin of unbelief is a bit of a mystery. If I know that God is able to do the impossible, then why would I fear or why would I doubt? You know, I mean, Jesus was kind of amazed. He was a little puzzled. It was a mystery to him when his disciples on the boat, you know, in the storm and they were afraid. And he would say to them many times, Jesus would say, how is it that you're afraid? Right? He's like, I'm here. I can do anything. I've already turned, you know, I've already broken the bread and the fishes and I've, I've done this. I've raised Lazarus. All the things you've seen me do. And Jesus is like, this is a mystery, guys. I can't understand how you... Don't believe. It's a mystery. If I know God's able to do anything, why would I doubt him? Why would I fear? Yet I do. Conviction is a horrible feeling, isn't it? Don't you hate it? When you do the wrong thing and you feel bad, you feel guilty. Isn't that a horrible feeling? It's horrible. When we resist temptation, it's a good feeling. When we give in to temptation, it's a bad feeling. Why would we ever give in to temptation? It's a mystery. But we do. It's a no-brainer, really. It's frustrating when you don't want to do the things that you want to do, right? In other words, your flesh wants to do something, but your spirit doesn't want to do that because you know the consequences. So you don't want to do the thing that you do want to do, right? I've prayed so many times, Lord, just, this is why I think we come before the Lord, we say, Lord, just change my desires, right? Change my heart so that I don't want to do the things that I'm not supposed to do. It's a very frustrating thing. Jesus told the disciples when he was asking them to pray in the garden and they were just so tired and they couldn't do it. He said, guys, look, your spirit, this is huge. I think all of us as human beings who love Jesus can relate to this one thing that Jesus said. He said, guys, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Your heart is in the right place. And he says, I know you want to honor me, but your flesh is so weak, it just can't help itself but fall asleep. That's the way we are as Christians in a sinful world still still living in with this sinful nature. We have a desire to honor God and to do the right thing, but we find this war that Paul talks about within us 
Our, our, our spirit is willing. God, I want to do everything you want me to do, and I don't want to do anything you don't want me to do. I, I guarantee you, if I was to ask everybody to raise your hand, how many of you don't want to do anything God don't want you to do, and you want to do everything God wants you to do, every one of us raise our hands, and you know, is it because we're, being, we're fibbing? No, I believe every person in this room would mean it. I don't want to do the things that God doesn't want me to do. Yet when we walk out the door, we find ourselves in situations. Here comes the temptation. Here comes the father of lies. Here comes the deception. And in many cases, we end up choosing the iniquity. We end up choosing the curse over the blessing. Paul writes about this in Romans 7. I'm not going to go into all of it, but he's talking about this very thing, basically. Paul is saying, you know, why, why do I sin when I don't want to? That's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 7. I would encourage you to read Romans chapter 7, by the way. He's like, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to sin, but I find myself kind of falling short. Um, but he writes this. Wretched, this is verse 24 and 25. He said, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? This wretched man that I am. Who, how in the world? Because here's, here's the problem. I've already presented the problem. The problem is sin is a mystery. We don't want to do it, but we do it. You leave here thinking, okay, well, that's great. But what do I do about that? And that's what Paul is saying here. He's like, wretched man that I am? Why did I do that? I didn't want to do that. Why did I say that? I didn't want to say that. Paul was struggling with the same thing. And here's how he ends it. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's recognizing that Jesus is the absolutely only answer. If you and I have any chance of overcoming sin and all of the bad consequences that come with it, we have to seek Jesus with everything that's within us. Paul is saying, Jesus is my only answer. Jesus took care of the sin problem. I know that Jesus died for me to cover my past sins, my present sins, my future sins, and I have to resort all of that to him. Understanding, A, he is very patient with me through my failures. But also understanding, B, he wants to transform me so that I don't continue to sin in the same old ways that I, he can change us. Does anybody still believe that this morning? I believe that he can change us. Does that mean that we ever will come to a place of perfection where sin is not an issue that we struggle with? Never. We're always going to have sin to struggle with. We're always going to fall short. But when we do, when we have those moments where we can't figure out why in the world we just did what we didn't want to do, but we look at Jesus and say, thank you, Jesus, for dying on that cross to cover my stupid sin. And even though I know there's consequences down the road, I know that his grace covers me and forgives me Jesus is the solution to the sin problem. See, I, I, if, I, if I were to give you, if I were to stand up here and say, okay, look, you get on Amazon and you get this book. It's a 10-step program for how to not sin anymore. How to, how to choose the right thing and, and not sin. Everybody in this room would buy it. If I say it's a, it's a surefire way, 10 steps that you can do, and there's books out there like that. 10 things you can do to overcome sin, man, we'd buy it, we'd read it, and we'd look at it. If, if, but here's the thing, you can't find the answer in a 10-step program written by a man who struggles with sin himself, right? I'm not knocking all of those books. You can find some good things in there. But my, it's, it's actually simpler than that. If I said, here's 10 things you can do to overcome it, we would all do it. But the thing is, in that sense, we're relying on our own strength again. Here's the thing. I can't save myself and I can't sanctify myself. Meaning this, we know that salvation, when we get saved, there's nothing I can do to earn that. It is a gift from God. Sanctification is the process, the daily process in which we change, in which we overcome sin. So God doesn't say, well, you can't earn your salvation. I have to give you that, but you have to earn your sanctification. You have to, you have to earn the way of overcoming sin. No, that is an act of grace, just the same as salvation is an act of grace. It's, the pl it's much simpler than getting a 10-step process in which you have to do something. Draw closer to Jesus than you've ever drawn closer to him before. He is the answer. You say, well, that sounds so simple. Isn't it? Isn't it simple? Here's what I find. Here's what I found in my own personal life. And I'm not standing up here and telling you I've got this sin thing whipped because I don't. I still struggle. I still fall short. But I have seen, and I'm sure that many of you can testify, that in your life, you have overcome things that used to trip you up, th ways that you used to sin, things that used to have you bound. I have been set free and delivered by so many of those things 
and to God only be the glory for that. Was it something I did? Did I, okay, well, I did this, I did that, I, and, and I overcame the sin? Not at all. I look back and I see that it was only the grace of God who reached down into the pit and pulled me out and gave me solid ground to walk on. Jesus is faithful. He alone is the answer. Seek him with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Just seek Jesus. Don't seek a method. Seek Jesus. And he'll help us. We can either turn our sins over to him now, or we will answer to him for our sins later. Amen? According to the scripture. See, when Jesus died on the cross, the judgment for my sin was already taken care of. And your sin. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, punishment for your sin, done. Jesus took that. And so, we stand before God on that great judgment day. Each one of us, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Nobody will avoid that. Nobody. The most powerful men on planet earth will kneel before Jesus just the same as I will and you will. Pleading for mercy if they don't know him. Amen. And think about this. On judgment day, God says, okay, I laid out for you what I wanted you to do and not do. I gave you the commandments, okay? We have them based on scripture, but even God has built into the human nature. Every human group knows that it's wrong to kill somebody, right? God says, I, I laid out for you what I wanted you to do and what you didn't want to do. And every single, think about this, every single time we sin, it's recorded, okay? Every time, from the time that we're born and we begin to realize what sin is. When I'm told to do this and I do this. That's sin. Every single sin is recorded. The Bible says that we will give an account for every idle word that we speak on the day of judgment. Every single sin recorded. And then when I stand before God, if I don't know Jesus now. Every sin I've ever committed, recorded I reject Jesus, and then when I die, I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and I look God in the face, and he says, I told you not to do this, and you did it. I told you to do this, and you didn't do it. It was a mystery. Why, Why did you not obey me? And every single one of those sins, I believe, will be announced and will be judged for every single one of those. Folks, I can't count how many sins I've committed in my lifetime. And to have every one of those sins brought up and he says, here's all the times that you didn't do what I wanted you to do. And to be judged for those, and the Bible says that in the end, the final judgment for that person will be this. Depart from me, worker of iniquity, sin. I never knew you. And those souls cast into hell for all eternity. That's a horrible thought. I get no pleasure out of telling you that this morning. The mystery, that's the mystery of iniquity. Why would I reject Jesus if I know that ultimately I'll go to hell without him? That doesn't make any sense, does it? That's a mystery. But on the flip side, sin, sin our whole life. And when we come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, somebody like me, or you, you hear a sermon like this, or you read it in the Word, or you hear it, whatever, they hear it in a song, and you realize that Jesus was God 2,000 years ago. God came to this earth in human form. And he experienced pain, all the pain that came from sin, right? Even though he himself had never sinned. He could have come to this earth and he could have lived a life where he could smash his thumb with a hammer and not hurt. That's not what he chose to do. He chose to live in a body just like ours so that when they hit him with the whip, it hurt. When they drove the nails through his hands, it hurt. And we stop and we realize 2,000 years ago, God came to this earth, died on that cross to pay the price. She mentioned it earlier. I should have been the one crucified. I should have been the one to pay for my own sins. But Jesus paid for it there at the cross. And whenever we recognize that and we receive him as our Lord and our Savior, we repent of all of our sins and we put all, all of our faith now is in Jesus. I don't have to worry about my past sins because Jesus took care of that for me. 
And throughout my life, as I fall short, the Holy Spirit will convict me. You shouldn't have said that. I'll repent. He forgives me. I live now from the, from the moment that I accepted Jesus as my Savior, from that moment to the day that I die, I live under the grace of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. I still have no fear of worrying or being judged for my sin when I stand before God. I will stand before God the same as everybody. And rather than having God announce every sin I ever committed, I will stand there and all that will be seen is the blood of Jesus Christ. I will stand there as though I've never sinned a day in my life. God will say, there's no sins here for this guy to, I mean, I've committed a lot of sins in my life. But when I stand before God, there are no sins here for me to judge you on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All because of Jesus. Jesus will stand there beside me and you at our judgment, I believe, with all of my heart. His arm around us, I got, I got this one covered. My blood, Father, covers all of his sins. Debt, wiped clean. We sang that song a minute ago. He paid a debt, he didn't know. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. One sin in our life is enough that we could never do enough good deeds to override it. That's just the way that it works. Hallelujah. I don't have to worry about that judgment day. It's a mystery. So this morning, so we come to a place where it's, it's kind of an opportunity for all of us to make a decision here. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and today God is giving you opportunity. We sang that song a little bit. We thank you, Lord, for being, we are in your presence. God is here. His spirit is here in this room and he is more than willing to save you today, to forgive you of your sins. When I talked about how, I mean, you know you're going to die. That was no revelation to you. When I say, hey, everybody in this room is going to die, nobody said, really? I didn't know that. I thought I was going to live forever. Nobody thought that. Everybody knows that was no revelation. You know you're going to die. But maybe for the first time you had, you really stopped to think about, oh, standing in front of God and being judged for all my sins. What about that one? What about that one? What about all of them? And that sparked fear in you. You recognize that. I don't want that to happen. I want Jesus to stand by me when I'm judged so that my sins can be under the blood and I know that I can go to heaven. That's where this is important. That's where we're at right here in the point of this service. This is the opportunity for you to say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. I accept you. I receive you. I look to you to wash away all of my sins. Please come into my life. Cleanse me. Make me new. And he will. Bow with me this morning, if you would, please. Father, such a solemn time, such an important moment in the life of people today who are not saved. That have never invited you into their life to be Savior. Today, we ask you to open the windows of heaven and let them feel and see and experience your mercy like they've never experienced it before. It is not me that saves. My words will not do it. It is a work of your spirit. And we trust that you'll do your job today, Lord, because you always said you would.